Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Outrage continues over a video APTN released earlier this week showing an RCMP officer questioning an Indigenous teen girl about an alleged sexual assault. At an event in Winnipeg, NDP party leader Jagmeet Singh called the video disgusting. As Brittany Hobson reports, Singh is calling for a review into the case. NDP leader advise, Jagmeet Singh says he was shocked that, uh, after watching the video of an Indigenous think, teen being questioned by think, RCMP. I mean, think, I just... It was disgusting to watch that video. Uh, the fact that this time and, and day uh, a survivor would be treated in such a way with just um, a complete lack of sensitivity, awareness of how someone should be, should be dealt with, a complaint of that nature should be respected, taken seriously. The video, which is from 2012, shows a teen being questioned by Kelowna RCMP were after reporting an alleged sexual assault. Because I need to know, were you at all turned on during this at all, no. even a little bit? No. Physically, you weren't at all responsive to his advances, even maybe um, subconsciously? Maybe subconsciously, but no, not. I was really scared. I mean, he's taking your clothes off. How much of a fight did you put up for him not but to I take your clothes off? But I don't remember him taking my clothes off. Like, but you I told just... me, like, I'm reading in your statement right here where it says you took I don't... He took your pants and your shirt off and your yeah, phone I fell out of your pocket when you, your shirt came off. I remember that, but I, I don't, like, <laughs> it's hard to explain. I don't, like, I didn't think. I just went, like, there's a fight or flight response and you... <laughs> Mm-hmm. Singh is calling for a review into the way police handle sexual assault cases. Uh, they need to be trained appropriately, make sure the questions they're asking are appropriate, and that there's this uh, general sense of treating human beings with respect and dignity, particularly someone who's marginalized and vulnerable after going through an assault of that nature. In the video, the male officer interviews the teen for more than two hours without anyone present. The Bear Clan Patrol's James Fable works with vulnerable people daily. He says protocols need to be put into place. When we're dealing with uh, street-involved people, uh, we always have the male-female balance, and I think that that should be carried forward in all uh, of these kinds of industries. When you have, um, you know, a single male uh, police officer working with a, a traumatized female youth, that, that's not an appropriate balance there. You need to have a woman in there to deal with her. In a statement sent Wednesday, RCMP would not comment on the 2012 investigation, but instead said, we do understand there is a greater discussion taking place around sexual assault investigations. Adding, the RCMP has been public in the past around the evolution of police investigational standards and training. Leah Gazan is running for the NDP in this fall's federal election. She says the video is proof of the challenges Indigenous women face with police services. There's still much work to do and women need to have a safe place to go and they need to know that when they are not safe uh, that they will be protected. What happened was unacceptable and uh, it needs to be addressed seriously. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. For more on this story, we're joined by APTN Investigates producer Holly Moore. Holly, thanks for joining us to talk about this important story. What's been the reaction to it? So it's had a phenomenal reaction. The uh, video has sent, and the story itself has essentially, um, you know, sparked outrage across the country. Uh, in a rare move yesterday, both sides of the House, so the opposition and um, the Prime Minister's side, stood up in unison to universally condemn uh, the remarks made in this video. We've heard from sexual assault survivors, we've heard from lawyers, we've heard from Indigenous women's groups who said, you know, if you're surprised at this kind of video, then you haven't been paying attention right. to what we've been saying for decades. Now, of course, as we know, this will bring a lot of attention to the young girl involved. Uh, how is she handling that? You know, she's okay. She has, a, you know, just this incredible resilience and courage. Um, she is, of course, overwhelmed by the support, but also overwhelmed by the attention. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a big, big deal, and uh, we're the only news outlet that is really directly in touch with her. Uh, so I'm very concerned about making sure that we're reporting this in a trauma-informed way, uh, you know, checking in with her on what is being reported 
mentioned. We've gotten a little bit of pushback from people saying, you know, that this is exploitation, mm -hmm. we're exploiting this situation. That's not the case. Uh, the victim herself essentially wanted this story out there. Um, I won't say she initiated it, but she definitely has been supportive of the coverage that we've been giving it. Yeah. It has received a lot of reaction and struck a chord with a lot of people uh, that we're seeing, you know, in comments and stuff, uh, the general public. Why do you feel that is? Well, I think because it crosses all boundaries, right? This is a really rare intersection where we see gender-based violence uh, clash with authority. We see race-based violence clash with authority. Women, uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, have said for years that this is how they're treated mm -hmm. when they walk into police stations. Now, this is a very graphic example of that. The types of interrogation was, you know, techniques that you reserve for a hardened criminal, not somebody who had come to, you know, take, uh, to look for some justice and help. I think part of the other reason that it's resonating so uh, strongly with people is because of this sympathy towards this young person. I, I you know, I, I had to watch the first, like the entire two and a half hour long video mm -hmm. and I was just amazed. I, I'm not sure that I would have uh, held up to that kind of questioning and you know she never capitulates she never changes her story so I think it's a really graphic example of how we need some judicial reform in how sexual assault victims in particular indigenous sexual assault victims are being treated by the police there's a lot of uh, government officials uh, mm -hmm. and uh, politicians weighing in on this what happens next well, uh, right now we're just looking at what kind of follows that we can do. There's certainly a lot of things that are developing as we go forward. Uh, we are hoping to talk to the Children's Advocate uh, in BC tomorrow. Uh, we've gotten reaction from the minister, the BC Minister of Child and Family Development, to say that it is a sickening video mm -hmm. um, and expressing that you know they're, they're going to need to make some changes here. The RCMP has been fairly tight-lipped about what right. they're planning to do about this. So we're, you know, we're following, and we're we're going to stay on this story. And there will be some very uh, significant de significant developments next week. Well, Holly, we appreciate you coming on and speaking with us about it. Thanks so much, Dennis. Thanks. An update now on another story we brought you this week about a Mohawk man who decided to go without insurance rather than pay Quebec sales tax. Well, today he got some good news. After APTN News aired its story, ProMutual Insurance contacted Walter David of Ganesatage to apologize. They now recognize that he lives on Mohawk territory and is therefore within his rights to not pay taxes on services delivered to the reserve. David is the co-owner of Moccasin Joe, a coffee roasting business which he had insured with the company, he says he's pleased with the outcome. The Saskatchewan Children's Advocate says Indigenous youth are dying by suicide much more often than non-Indigenous youth, especially in the northern part of the province. Corio Soup says his department's research shows that Indigenous girls are 29 times more likely to die by suicide than their non-Indigenous counterparts. And Indigenous boys are nine times more likely to die by suicide than non-Indigenous boys. He says cyberbullying and mental health are behind youth suicides and the province could be doing a lot more to fight it. Our province uh, currently spent around 5% of their budget, their, their health budget on mental health. Now with the recent announcements that I'm aware of, that has taken it to almost 6%. The national average is still 7 We have um, other provinces spending up towards 10% of their health budget on mental health. Now I think we need to shoot for a little higher than average here in Saskatchewan and like aim for that 9 to 10%. Two major developments in the Senate as the work on Parliament Hill is coming to a close. A bill on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has received the go-ahead from the Senate, who have sent the bill known as C-262 to committee. That means the bill that would require Canada to take all measures necessary to ensure that the laws of Canada are in line with the UN Declaration still has a chance of becoming law. 
Last night, the Senate defeated Bill C-48. That was meant to limit oil tankers along BC's north coast. Still to come, our interview with former NHLer Jordan Tutu. First, a look at what Nation to Nation has in store for tonight's show. What's coming up on Nation to Nation? This week, the House of Commons heard two motions about declaring a climate change emergency. The first one came yesterday from the NDP, and today it was from Environment and Climate Change Minister Catherine McKenna. Our political panel of MPs debate their party's respective plans to respond. At least the NDP and the Liberals do while the Conservatives' environmental policy will come out in three weeks. Green Party leader Elizabeth May, meanwhile, drops by to say it's about time, but remains skeptical about the timing of it all. That's coming up right after the national news. Here's a look at Friday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Sunny and 11 for Charlottetown, 16 with rain for Halifax. Five in Nain, 18 above under the sun in Kuchuak. Ten with rain for Quebec City, rain and 15 for Montreal. 19 and rain for Peterborough, 17 with showers for Ottawa. 14 with the sun out in Thunder Bay, 13 in Sioux Lookout with sunny skies. Seven and a possibility of snow for Thompson, seven and sunny in God's Lake. 15 under the sun for Winnipeg and Gimli. 14. Welcome back. By his own account, he was living the rock star life. But Jordan Tutu was battling demons off the ice. Now the NHL's first Enoch player is speaking up about difficult topics like addiction and suicide. I sat down with him earlier this week. Jordan, thanks for joining us, and uh, for those who, who aren't aware, maybe you can tell us uh, a bit about why suicide prevention and, and what you've been talking about is so important to yourself. Yeah, you know, we all know suicide is an epidemic in our Indigenous communities uh, across Canada, and for, for me personally to experience uh, tragedy uh, within my family, uh, my brother Terrence taken his... Uh, his own life in 2002 was uh, was devastating to not only myself uh, but my immediate family and you know the indigenous communities across Manitoba, Canada, and and up in Nunavut. So it holds a very special place in my heart to um, to tell my story and to to reach out to our our remote communities and let them know that you know, we're resilient. We know how to battle through hard times mentally. You're, uh, you know, speaking with youth and, and others coast to coast to coast with uh, what's really a, a deeply personal uh, tragedy for yourself, uh, the things you've gone through. Has this been uh, difficult for you to do this? Actually, it's been uh, a, a healing process. You know, it, it, it takes time. Um, but for me uh, to be able to be comfortable and content in my own skin took a long time to be open and honest and to communicate. I didn't know how to talk about my feelings. Uh, I didn't know how to express my feelings. But through my sobriety and, uh, and working every day, working hard, it's um, brought me peace and, and harmony. And you know, now I can say I'm very comfortable and content in my own skin. And that's why I'm able to, to share my story. Um, as natives, we, uh, we tend to hold a lot in and use substances to, to help cope with, uh, with issues. And I've dealt with that. And now it's just about me telling my story and having our people relate and say, hey, if, if Jordan has dealt through it, been through it. You know, he's he's played in the NHL. He's been a professional athlete. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. We all fight a fight. No one knows about. Be kind to one another. You talk about the healing process, uh, and you say being on the land was what was your healing process. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So I I grew up hunting and fishing. Um, I, I know that in my experience that you know 
as natives, we can go and see all the doctors we want and, and psychologists and therapists, but I didn't find that was enough for me. And when I reconnected with the land and, and was out there and really just sat there in the moment and, uh, and absorbed life that was going on around me and, and really looking back and saying how simple life is out there. You know, I lived a pretty fast-paced life for the last 20 some odd years and when I'm out on the land, it, it's it's that peaceful peacefulness, the harmony, the connection, um, honesty, and just just being present. You're speaking here at uh, Vision Quest to uh, youth and a, a number of uh, Indigenous peoples about your journey and. and one of the things that uh, stuck out for me was uh, you talking about you never won a Stanley Cup, but uh, how your kids are your Stanley Cup. What's family uh, meant to you through all of this? Well, we all know in our in our communities, families mean everything. Um, you know, for me to experience tragedy and and that cycle well onto its next victim. You know, for me, it was it was time for change, not only for myself, but for my family, my immediate family. You know, I I sobered up to stop one cycle and start a new cycle. For for my kids, um, for the youth out there. You know, obviously we're gonna we're gonna go through hard times throughout our life, and and you know experience things that will teach us you know obviously you learn from your mistakes I've failed more often than pe people have seen um, but at the same time we're resilient we know how to fight through hard times but ultimately family is everything you know your speech has really impacted people when there were people standing up in a room of hundreds uh, today to, to tell their own story of tragedy or inspiration even as well. Is that what you're, you're seeing out there on the road? Yeah, you know what, it's, it's, it's about starting a conversation. And for me to be able to, to share my story with, uh, with the Indigenous communities, it's real talk. You know, I, I live that life. I lived the life of being from a remote community, uh, isolated community who, who's been through tragedy, triumph, substance abuse. And so for me to share, it really helps people in, in, in the audience to kind of take a few steps back and say, wow, you know, if Jordan can talk about it, maybe it's time for me to to raise my voice and and change, make some changes. There's a lot of up and coming uh, Indigenous athletes, both in the NHL, but even younger than that, people who still, uh, even though you're not playing today, uh, look up to you as a role model. What's your your message to those youth? Well, it's it's an honor and a privilege to uh, help pave the way for our indigenous athletes. Um, you, you look down the line, Jonathan Chichu, um, you know, the Nolan brothers, Ted Nolan, mm -hmm. Stan Jonathan, Gino Ojek, uh, Sandy McCarthy, you know, these guys are, have been the trailblazers in, in our indigenous communities. And for me to be a part of that is, a, is an honor. Um, you know, I get to tell my story to these kids and, and let them know that hey it doesn't matter where you're from what color your skin is we you know the game of hockey sports in general is uh is all about inclusivity and, and that's what it's all about well jordan you can tell that uh, you had a big impact on a lot of people in that room today and uh, appreciate what you've done for the sports and for our people and uh, for sitting down with us here today my pleasure thank you thanks thank you Time for a quick break, but stick around. There's more to come.
forecast. 19 above under sunny skies for Peace River, 17 in Fort McMurray. A high of 8 with showers for Medicine Hat, 16 under the sun for Edmonton. A rainy day on the west coast, 18 for Campbell River and Vancouver. 20 under the sun for Fort Nelson, 15 with showers in Prince George. 16 in Whitehorse, 18 for Dawson, Mayo and Watson Lake, 14 in Old Crow, 21 in rain for Fort Liard and Trout Lake, 13 in Yellowknife, minus one in Saks Harbor, rain and plus four for Politak. Plus two with a chance of snow for Repulse Bay, zero and snow for Whale Cove and Arviette, two above for Callowit, plus three in Pangerton. Welcome back. The child welfare system is supposed to care for children. So what happens when that system in Alberta failed? APTN National News reporter Chris Stewart set out to get answers. Here's a preview of his show for APTN Investigates When Child Welfare Fails. And a warning to some viewers, the subject matter is graphic in nature. If you ever tell anyone about the things I have done to you, I will find you and I will kill you. I was abused sexually by her boyfriend uh, for about well, till I was nine years old and it almost happened quite frequently. Children under the protection of the Alberta Children's Services have suffered. 741 children died in the system over a 14 year period. A grim average of 53 kids dying every year. One child died every week. One life lost. And in 2017, 2018, not much better news. 33 children died under their protection. Alberta Children's Services undoubtedly failed these youth. But those numbers do not capture the children who have been mentally, physically, and sexually abused. Children like Stephen Morin. When I was about four years old, my mom, um, something happened in my home with me and my sibling, and uh, it caused my mom to go through a lot of grief and she had to give me up to, uh, she had to call child welfare and tell them she couldn't handle me anymore. And you can watch that entire episode tomorrow night on APTN Investigates right after this program. And that is your APTN National News for this Thursday. There's a lot more over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Stick around for Nation to Nation with Todd Lamoran. That's next. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.